I'd like you to take your Bibles, turn to the book of Jonah chapter 3. We want to talk about, we're, we're going to change tax just a little bit. We've been, the last uh, several weeks, we've been kind of taking a historical account and historical journey in the first two chapters of Jonah. Uh, as we get into chapter 3, I want to kind of change the delivery method a little bit, okay? And the reason why I want to do this is because... Um, here uh, last year, we spent uh, a good amount of time talking about the biblical necessity of discernment, and really what that boils down to is knowing what the message is, knowing what scripture says, so that we can not only apply it, but so that we can share it most effectively, right? Um, trust me when I say that there are, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of what I would call quote-unquote theology books, but if those theology books do not line up with Scripture, then it's a false theology, right? And so we as the children of God, we need to know what we believe. It's not just enough to know that. We need to know why we believe it so that we can connect some of these dots as we look at what Scripture says in light of what is going on around us. Okay? We need to do that. And part of that is knowing what the problem is. There's a man that went to the doctor and uh, said, you know, uh, Doc, you got to help me out. There's a problem with my wife. She, she just doesn't seem to be able to hear me. I think she's losing her hearing. Uh, and she won't do anything about it. Uh, I tell her and I tell her and she won't do anything. Doctor says, I'll tell you what you do. You, you go home and, and you, you ask her, and you say, honey, what's for dinner? You know, you ask her that from the front door and then you move to the living room. And then you move to the kitchen and then you move right beside her. So he says, well, I'm going to do that. So he gets home, he does exactly as he's instructed and from the, from the front door, honey, what's for dinner? And nothing. Goes into the living room and, honey, what's for dinner? Still no response. Goes into the kitchen, honey, what's for dinner? Nothing. Goes right up behind her, honey, what's for dinner? She says, I've told you four times it's spaghetti. You need to know what the problem is, right? <laughs> Sometimes we need to be able to, uh, to recognize that the problem isn't always another person. Sometimes the problem is us, right? But regardless of where that problem is, you need to know where, uh, where the problem lies. And so when we look at Jonah, and we've seen this in the first two chapters, <clears throat> Uh, as we spend three weeks in the first two chapters, we know what, the, what Jonah's problem was. Uh, he rebelled against God, right? He was disobedient, and because of that, he suffered some grave consequences. He had to learn a very important truth, and that truth is this, is that when it comes to obeying the will of God, there is no account for flexibility. We do what God has called us to do. We do what he has told us to do. When we looked into Joshua chapter 2, that last verse, the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon dry land. That is a rather, I'm sorry, that is a rather gross description of the delivery method that God used to get him back on track again. Some folks have said, and I think I alluded to this, that the prophet made the fish sick. We don't know. Here's what we do know is that uh, uh, God can use anything, anywhere, at any time to see his will accomplished, and it will be accomplished in spite of you. There is no one that can thwart the will of God, right? And so here God is working with Jonah now he is on dry land, and it is at this point, because remember, in the belly of this big fish, Jonah is pouring out his heart while he has seaweed wrapped around his head, and he is really saying, 
uh, you know what, God, I messed up. And he goes back, and, and as he is uh, talking to God, he is saying, I'll do what you want me to do. Well, Jonah did that. He's on dry land now, but when we look at Jonah, and we look at what our definition of a prophet is, you know what, Jonah doesn't really fit the picture of a prophet, does he? I mean, how many times in Scripture do we see prophets who will tell God, no, you're wrong, you just don't see it that often, right? Jonah doesn't fit the stereotype of what we would think a prophet is. We know that Jonah has been called to preach a message, right? And this is a message of repentance. Remember, the book of Jonah isn't about a big fish. Big fish figures prominently into the, into the account, but it has nothing to do with the big fish. It has everything to do with the grace and the mercy that God is trying to show to the people of Nineveh. And God is using Jonah to bring this message of repentance. And so when we look at Jonah and we say to ourselves, well, man, he just doesn't quite seem like a prophet to me. Well, he was right and god used him and we're going to we're going to look at that next week but when we look at the characteristics of a true prophet there's four things that we want to look at now some of these things are going to mirror what you heard last year we are looking at it perhaps through a little bit different lens okay but the first part is this a true prophet is an ordinary man, just an ordinary guy. You know what? God doesn't look for superstars to do his work. He doesn't. God will use us. God will use ordinary people. You know what Paul says? That he uses the simple to confound the wise. And I think that's very true. So very often we will look up to all these superstars and you know what, I, I gotta confess, maybe I'm out of the loop, maybe I'm old, uh, maybe it's just that I don't care anymore, I don't know. But all of these big name athletes, you know what, I know a lot of them back from when I was growing up. I can't tell you who they are now. Why? Because really, you know what, uh, if they're out there on the field or the basketball court, people are paying money to watch them on the basketball court and maybe nothing else, right? Um, I don't care if a sports figure likes a certain brand of potato chip and that makes me want to go out and buy it. Uh, trust me, it doesn't. You know, uh, I'm not sure that I, uh, that I espouse their, their views on this or that or anything else. They can say whatever they want because of who they are. Let me say this. You can say whatever you want because who you belong to, right? We have a great message to proclaim, right? And, you know, Clay, I'm just going to pick on you because I can. Um, I don't watch basketball much, but you're not seven foot tall. Used to be. <laughs> That's before Gabe went like this and leaned on you. Okay. Uh, you, you know, chances are uh, uh, Clay is not going to be the starting center uh, for any basketball game. Uh, I can say that because neither will I, right? Uh, not going to happen. It doesn't matter what people say. God uses us, uses ordinary people. You know what I love about that is we're all different. Right? And we all have different uh, fears and different things that are going on about us. Remember Moses? God used Moses in a great way, but do you know that Moses had a fear of public speaking, right? Lord, here am I, but send Aaron, is really what he said. So I did a quick, I did a quick look. 
And it was on the internet, so it must be true. What is it that people fear the most? Number one is public speaking. Duty number two is death. So people would rather die than speak in public. That's what I take away from that. Am I wrong? Here's Moses. Moses died. God called Joshua. And three times in one chapter in the book of Joshua, God tells Joshua to be bold and courageous. Three times. He gives, the, gives him that encouragement to be bold, to be strong, to be of good courage. It makes me wonder if one of, jo, uh, one of Joshua's character traits was maybe he wasn't so courageous. I mean, he was told this three times in one chapter. So we have that. Joshua, after Joshua, God called Gideon. And we know the story of Gideon. Gideon is hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat. An angel appears to him, says, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. He's in a wine press. And here's an angel saying that he is a mighty man of valor. And boy, that had to be proven to Gideon before he would do anything at all. Let me say this. These men here, you know what? When we look in scripture, we hold them in very high regard, don't we? I mean, we do. But when you look at them, they're like us. They're just very ordinary men. And we could keep going. We could look at David. Uh, we could look at Elijah. Uh, we could go on and on. We look at Jonah. You know what? Jonah had likes and dislikes just like the rest of us. And just like us at times, Jonah was willing to quit the race if he didn't like what he was being told to do. We see that God is giving Jonah the command, go to Nineveh and preach a message of repentance. Well, we know that Jonah didn't really like that, and that's what led to his whole going the other way, right? And led to all of chapter 1 and chapter 2. So we see that. Jonah was unwilling to align himself with the will of God. Plain and simple. And we do that as well. Let me say this. God takes ordinary people, like you, like me. There are times where he uproots us from places of comfort, and he puts us in a place to reach those who are lost, those who are unreached. There's going to be times God calls us to do some things that we couldn't even begin to fathom. Right? But God calls us to do those things. Secondly, we know this. God's messengers are obedient people. They are obedient people. When God tells us to do something, we need to do exactly that. Remember when I said that God's will will be realized whether you're part of uh, whether you're obedient to uh, his will or not, that's very true. Can I say it's much better to be in his will than not? Right? Um, it just is. God has a way of getting our attention, doesn't he? Do you think this big fish got Jonah's attention? Oh, I'm thinking he probably did. God's messengers will be obedient people. They will be obedient to the message of God and to the will of God. Thirdly, every prophet, preacher, or believer who shares their testimony with an unbeliever is an ambassador of God. An ambassador is one who represents 
someone else. The ambassador's job is to deliver the message. You know what? The job of an ambassador isn't to make the other person agree with it. It's simply to give the message. And that's what the ambassador does. So here we are. You know, we are told that we are ambassadors of Christ. What does that mean? It means that we go out into a world that needs Jesus Christ, and we are simply sharing the message. Right? Can I make anyone listen to me? <laughs> no, I can't. Okay? Can I make anybody repent and believe? That's not my job. Right? My job is simply to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And as an ambassador, that's what we are to do. And whenever we share the gospel with others, we are an ambassador of Christ. Fourthly, a true prophet, and this is important, a true prophet is impartial in how he preaches the word. Can I say this, that scripture has never changed. And it is scripture that we teach, it is scripture that we preach. There are some that will say, I will minister to this one group, but not another. There are some that will take this scripture or that scripture and will twist it to meet their own interpretation or their own idea. A true prophet doesn't do that. A true prophet is impartial in how he preaches the word. So what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, it means that as preachers, as pastors, as teachers, we are to make sure that we are studying rightly, right? That we are prepared rightly. It also means this, that in our proclamation of the gospel, we are making it very clear when we look at Jonah, we see that he had a message that he was given, and he was given this message by God himself. He had a message to give. It was a message that he didn't want to give to Nineveh. There were cultural differences, military differences. These were a ruthless people. Jonah would have just as much assumed that God would destroy them. And God says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. They are deserving of mercy and grace. You know what, we would look at that today and, and we would say that there are so many people that are here on this earth that would not be deserving of God's grace. Scripture says that is wrong. Here's what Scripture says. Christ came to seek and to save those who are lost. That would be the most vile of sinner, right? That, first of all, let me say that would be you and I. And that would be the criminal. That would be the murderer. That would be any one of a number of people who have done the most heinous things in society, Christ still died for them. Why has, not, why has Christ not yet come back? There are still people to be redeemed. And we have no idea who they are. But we are told, going back to the previous point, as an ambassador to share with those that we come in contact with. A true prophet is impartial in how he preaches the word. That impartiality means that we are sharing Christ with everyone. There is also some characteristics of a divine message. We've kind of looked at the messenger briefly. 
we need to look at the message because there are so many folks that will say uh, they have revelation from God or they will, uh, they will say they have a different message than what is in Scripture. Uh, scripture tells us that we need to be discerning. We need to test the spirits to see if they are from God or not. And let me just say, there are a lot of them that are not from God. I'm just going to put that out there. Earlier, I kind of joked it was on the internet, it must be true. Um, boy, never was there a more false statement than that. If you look on YouTube, for example, you can see so many false teachers. And you know what? Boy, they can talk a good talk. And boy, they, they're charismatic. They've got the personality and... And uh, they, could, they could sell a drowning man a bottle of water. Uh, they can just do it all. But yet the message that they preach is anti-God. And so we want to look at the divine message. Number one, the message is going to reflect the character of God. It's going to reflect the character of God. What do we know about God? We know that he is loving. We know that he is merciful. We know that he is holy. We know that he is forgiving. We certainly know that he is full of compassion. We also know that he is a God of wrath, right? Because before we came to Christ, that's where our identity was. Right? You're either born again or you are children of wrath. Have you ever noticed that so many of the false teachers out there will never talk about the wrath of God? They will never talk about your sinful condition, but they will tell you that God loves you and wants you to be rich, and you can be rich if you send your money to them. The message reflects the character of of God. Why is it important that we are in the word? It is because we need to know what the word says so we can refute those things. Jonah certainly had a divine message, didn't he? A message of compassion, a message of mercy. That is what a message that reflects the character of God looks like. We also know this. Secondly, a message from God is going to be clear, and it's going to be definitive. Every person, every child in Nineveh could understand what Jonah had to say. What was that message? You find it in verse 1, or um, uh, verse 2 of chapter 1. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. You know what? That is rather cut and dry, right? Everybody could understand that. There was no theological jargon. There was no legalese. I, I'm not even sure that's a word. I have been working with some computer people with uh, some of the security issues uh, with our computers here at the church. And I had to tell uh, some of them, let's pretend I have no idea what you're talking about. I wasn't pretending. Let's pretend I, I know nothing. So let's start out with computers for dummies. And there was one person that typed back and said, you know, kind of laughed and said, oh, you shouldn't think of it that way. I do, because I know nothing. And I am very confident in saying exactly that. Don't use deep theological jargon and legalese and all of this stuff. It's a very simple message. 
There was someone who took a simple message and confused it this way. We respectfully petition, request, and entreat that a due and adequate provision be made this day and the day here and after subscribed for the satisfying of the petitioner's nutritional requirements and for the organizing of such allocation and distribution as may be deemed necessary and proper to assure the reception by and for said petitioners of such quantities of baked cereal products as shall, in the judgment of the aforementioned petitioners, constitute a sufficient supply thereof. Does anybody know what that means? Give us this day our daily bread. Can we confuse things? Oh, all the time. It hurt me just to read that. But the message from God is going to be clear and it's going to be definitive. You know what I love about the gospel? The gospel is very simple. Do you know why? Because I need simple. And I would dare venture a guess that you do as well. It is very true about the gospel. The gospel of salvation is so simple. There is no need to make it sound any different than what it is. Thirdly, a divine message draws attention to the message rather than the messenger. A divine message will always point to itself. It will always point to the character and nature of God and it will not glorify the person that is bringing the message. The prophet doesn't allow his message to be overshadowed by anything. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 says this, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. You know what? The message speaks for itself. The message will speak for itself. Can I say this? As we are sharing our testimonies and we are talking with others, can I say the gospel isn't about you? You are a recipient of the gospel, amen? If you, have been, uh, if you have been born again into the family of God and you have accepted Jesus Christ, you have professed and you have believed, you have repented of your sin, um, that is fantastic. But the gospel isn't about me, the messenger. The gospel is about what Christ has done. And we need to make sure that we make that the focus. We also know this, that the message from God is authoritative and that authority is found because it comes from God. People are always trying their best to be relevant as far as the world is concerned. But very often in their relevance, in their supposed relevance, they will say things like, thus saith the Lord. The Lord told me this. I think we need to be very careful with that. Because when we are doing that, we're doing several things. Uh, first of all, when, when we are saying, thus saith the Lord, all of a sudden, uh, we are finding ourselves as being spokesmen for God. Was it God that told you this? And this is a question that we must ask, right? We must ask this because there have been a lot of people that have said, thus saith the Lord, and things didn't come to pass. Here just a few short weeks ago, I, I saw where there was a well-known prosperity preacher uh, that said God told him that uh, there would be no war in the Middle East and that 
everything was going to blow over and everything was going to be fine. This is a well-known individual. I'll tell you who it was. It was Benny Hinn. Are you familiar with him? Two days later, there was all-out war. Can I say this? God never told him that. Never told him that. And so here's what he did. Well, God told me. Dangerous. That is taking the name of God to falsehood. That is actually violating one of the Ten Commandments. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, which means taking it to emptiness or falsehood. Don't say God told you this when obviously he did not. There was another instance of a, uh, another well-known prosperity preacher who, right at the beginning of COVID, do you all remember 2020? I think I have blocked that from my mind, okay? Uh, but this well-known person said, I decree that COVID is gone, and actually celebrated that COVID, because of his decree, had been eradicated from the face of the earth. How many of y'all have had COVID? Don't, I don't want to know. I'll raise both hands. You know what? The fact that it continues today. Did God tell him that COVID was destroyed? Did he say that God told him that? Yeah. You see where I'm going with this? These are two extreme examples, but so very often people will use that. And they will say... Those words, God told me this. We need to be very careful. Do you know how God speaks to us today? Right through his word. Justin Peters, he says this. Uh, uh, God speaks to us today. He speaks to us through his word. If you want to hear God speak out loud, read his word out loud. Uh, God speaks to us today, and a message from God is authoritative because it came from God. You know what? Jonah heard directly from God. Wouldn't that be amazing? You know, and there were other people in Scripture that heard directly from God, but do you know that that didn't happen very often? It just didn't. Okay? There were a handful of people who literally heard the voice of God. We need to be very careful that when we attribute things to God, that it lines up with his word. A message from God can also be recognized by the fact that it comes without an alternative. It's repent or perish. Okay? Those were the options that were given, and, and that was it. Notice there was no, um, well, I got it wrong, I actually meant this. It comes without an alternative. When God speaks and he gives a message to Jonah, the message is this, you are to preach this. So that brings us here to what I call the Nineveh campaign, and we're going to go through this here. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. He called out, yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He goes in. He gives the message. Why did they listen? Well, I think there's a couple reasons. The people of Nineveh were idolaters who thought that God could be bought off with some kind of offering or sacrifice they could not. Why would they listen to this foreigner telling them something? Well, history records that there had been 
two plagues where thousands had died, a total eclipse of the sun had happened just prior to Jonah's arrival, the people would see this as a divine judgment. And because of that, they would be very open to this message from God, obviously. Here's what we see. We see that Nineveh comes to repentance, amen? Uh, they heed the word of the Lord, and they did that because God had been preparing the hearts of the people in Nineveh, just as he had been preparing Jonah to give this message to them. God was in all of this. The people of Nineveh, they were prepared by God to hear the message. And then there was the matter of his preaching style. You know, us, us pastors, we, we preach differently, don't we? I mean, uh, I love listening to Pastor Harold preach, right? I always have. I preach differently than Pastor Harold, and that's okay. When I first came here, there was somebody that said, well, you don't preach like Pastor Corey. I said, that's right, I'm not Pastor Corey. I preach differently than he did, and that's okay. Jonah had a very distinct preaching style here. It says, Jonah cried his message. There was some desperation in his voice. I got the thing, being in the belly of a big fish for three days might have something to do with that. He learned the hard way, the, hard way, the cost of obedience... And there was a sense of conviction that came about his preaching. Jonah chapter 3, verse 5. We see the results of this. The people of Nineveh believed God. They caught for a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. They did not turn from their sin because Jonah looked like he came from central Hollywood casting, right? It had nothing to do with how he looked. It had nothing to do with anything of the sort. There was conviction of sin that happened here in Nineveh because Jonah finally goes to Nineveh and, and preaches the message that God had to give to Jonah for them. The Ninevites saw themselves as sinners who were condemned, and they needed forgiveness. And so the message that Jonah preached to these people, very similar to the message that we have today. Paul tells us, if you look in Romans chapter 1, uh, he, Paul tells us the whole world stands condemned in the sight of a holy God. And unless men and women everywhere repent of their sin, they will face the judgment of God. And this is exactly the message that Jonah had for the people of Nineveh. There was a sense of repentance that took place. And can I say that repentance is more than just a feeling bad about our sin. It's much more than that. It's about a change of mind about the sin. It's about doing a 180 degree turn and going exactly the opposite way. Jonah knew what that example was because he did exactly that, didn't he? And here, the people of Nineveh Repent of what they had done. There was evidence of their repentance. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth. According to verse 6, the message took hold on the common people first, and then the king heard what was going on. And not only did he do the same thing, but he put out a public decree that all would do that. The word reached the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne. He gave them the example. He removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and in ashes. 
Jonah's message was for everyone, from the most common to the most mighty, repent, repent. Here's what we do know. We, and we've already alluded to this this morning, that you know what, we are one day closer to the return of Christ, amen? You know what, it didn't happen yesterday. How do I know? I'm still here. We are one day closer to the return of Christ. But can I say this? There will come a day when Christ will return. He will come back. What does that mean? Well, if we look at that, we say to ourselves that while he has not yet to come, he will come and there will be a day when he will no longer wait. When will that day be? When all who will repent have done so. And again, that's why he hasn't come back. There are still yet people to be redeemed out of this ungodly world. God convicted them, and they repented. Jonah chapter 3, verse 8, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. You know what? The plagues, the eclipse, the preaching may have gotten their attention, but it was the Spirit of God that convicted them. And Jonah was obedient, finally, to share that message with them. This simple message of Jonah was repent. God won't wait for you forever. God will not wait forever in the here and now. So in order to be effective witnesses for him, I think there's three things that we need to recognize and we need to look at. Uh, the first one is this. We need to be open to the opportunities that the Lord brings our way. Uh, they are all around us. Okay? They are all around us. You know what it used to be? I hated waiting in lines. You know what lines can be the worst? When you have to go inside a pharmacy. Oh, that can be awful, right? You could be there, you could get there at 9 a.m. and still be there for dinner. Okay, maybe not that long. I used to hate waiting in lines. You know, now I, I strike up conversations with folk. You know, we'll be talking about this or that or everything else. What a great opportunity to share the gospel. You have them. They are not going to lose their place in line. Right? Share Christ. Be open to the opportunities that the Lord brings your way. I will say this, in an ungodly world, there is a spiritual hunger out there. And we need to be ready to engage that. Uh, secondly, we need to do as 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. And then it says, Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Sometimes we miss that part, don't we? We can't bash them over the head with the gospel, but we are to share the gospel, and we are to be ready to defend it. We share what we believe, and we share why we believe it. Thirdly, you know what? We need to pray for boldness, as we go, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. And I think we all know this, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer, with all supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am and ambassador in chains and he says that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Do you know who wrote that? 
That was the Apostle Paul that wrote that. And here's the Apostle Paul and everything that he has done, you know, uh, everything he did before he came to Christ, how Christ used him in a mighty way after his conversion, right? As he is going on the missionary journeys, as he is mentoring young men to take positions in the local church and how he is telling them and giving them what they need. How he is their cheerleader and is encouraging them in the faith and the bonds that the Apostle Paul has with these men, he calls them dear ones. He calls them brothers. He calls them sons in the faith, terms of endearment. The Apostle Paul wrote half of the New Testament. And here he says, pray that I may declare boldly as I ought to speak. You know what? Uh, when it comes to the New Testament, I often think there was nobody more bold than Paul in what he wrote. And yet here he is. Pray that I may declare it boldly. Why could he pray that way? Why could he deliver the message that way? Because he recognized the need for boldness. And we need to pray for that boldness. I would dare say if the Apostle Paul prayed for boldness, uh, we need to as well. We need to as well. There are a lot of things that we can draw out of the book of Jonah. And you know what? I love Jonah chapter 3 where we see the message of grace and redemption that reaches the people of Nineveh. Um, next week as we look into uh, Jonah uh, chapter 4. You know what? We're going to look at Jonah's anger. Because Jonah's still upset about this. Aren't you thankful that the book of Jonah isn't about Jonah's anger, but rather the Lord's compassion and the Lord's mercy and grace that he showed to a people who needed it. You know what? God is still in the mercy and grace business. And that's where we come in. We are called to share the good news of Christ. Father, we thank you for your word Father, we recognize that the world around us has so many ideas of what the gospel is and what it isn't. And Father, as your messenger, here on this earth, our prayer must be, Father, that people don't see us. They don't put us on a pedestal. But, Father, they listen to the message. They listen to the gospel and they repent and believe. Father, use us, we pray, in the name of Jesus, amen.